Thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate the fact that you take some of your time to sit and to listen to these teachings, and I'm trusting God that they benefit you. Now today, I want to carry on with the subject of anxiety and fear, and I'm going to look today at the subject of have no fear. And we're going to carry on, instead of looking at anxiety, I really want to look at something that is more akin to full-blown fear. And if I manage within the time, I'll speak a bit about phobias, otherwise we'll keep that for next week, as well as, as a whole lot of encouragement. So I've got quite a bit of scripture this week. Well, you know, there's nothing like the Word of God which is living and active, and it really is at work within us. And God says that his word never returns to him void or empty. It says it achieves its purpose. It accomplishes that for which it's sent. And so today you're going to be hearing scripture that speaks about how good God is and what his intention is towards us, his children. And so I'm trusting God that this word is actually going to fulfill the reason God spoke it. And something in your life is going to change. And something in my life as I, as I minister the word. Okay, so um, I want to look first of all at a scripture in 1 John 4.18, which is a very familiar scripture. And I'm going to be teaching out of the NIV today. And it says this, there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And, you know, there's an extraordinary amount of depth in that scripture. And really, it boils down to this, that if we know that God loves us, we're not going to be afraid of anything. We won't be afraid of judgment to come, of punishment headed our way, but If we know who God is and we know the love God has for us, it's going to bring not only a peace into our lives, it's going to bring within us a complete rest from all fear. Like fear won't even be something that is part of uh, of the way we think. It certainly won't be part of the way we act. And so, you know, when we're in fear, it's because we're not convinced that God is going to look after us, that he's going to protect us. I'm going to be doing these things. Today, I'm going to be looking more at God's provision. And I'm not even going to finish it in this first teaching. But I want to show you some of the, the scriptures pertaining to God's provision for us. And I want to ask you to take this and apply it to yourself. Okay, so uh, in verse in Romans 8... Um, reading from verses 31, from 31 to verse 33. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote. And he said, what then shall we say in response to all of this? And that was what went before. But he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? I'm going to read on in a moment, but just think of that. If God is for you, if he's on your side, and he is on our side, and so with God, As our great protector, who can be against us? All they are are human beings, creatures made of dust. And so he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? And then he says, who will bring any charge against God's elect? Uh, about all against those whom God has chosen. It is God who justifies. But I really want to go back to that. If God is for is for me, I know that it doesn't matter who's against me. I have got the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of all things on my side. And that is exactly the same for you. And then he says, he who did not spare his own son for us, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Now think about this for a moment. When Jesus was on the cross suffering and dying for our sin, uh, it says that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. And so the joy that was set before him was looking at you. And I really mean this, not looking at the whole world, but looking at you as an individual, because God is able to do that. He is able to see each of us and speak to each of us on our own as if we were the only person in the universe. And he can do that to billions of people at once. 
Don't ask how, because his ways are so much higher than our ways. We can't figure it out with our little finite brains. We just have to believe what he says. So when Jesus was on the cross, hanging stark naked as an adult man, for everybody to spit at him, mock him, uh, and just really humiliate and embarrass him, and he'd already been flogged so that his organs could be seen, Uh, He had already had the thorns pushed into his head and his beard plucked out so that the Bible says he didn't even look like a human being anymore. In Isaiah 52, 14, it says that he was marred beyond human likeness. And so he'd endured all of that. But it says, it says for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He put up with all that suffering and it says, and he, he scorned the shame of it. Um, And why was that? It was because he could see you and that you had been delivered out of darkness and brought into his light. You had chosen to believe in him as your Lord and your Savior. And that was the joy. And he saw me and he saw each person who is listening. And as he looked at that, he thought this is all worth it in order to save them. Now, if God did not spare Jesus knowing and understanding that he was going to go through all of that pain, suffering, humiliation, rejection, embarrassment, but mainly the agony and the anguish. And he was going to do that, having given him up for us all. Paul says, like, think about this. How will he not also, along with him, graciously, think of that word graciously, he will graciously give us all things. Because he's already given us heaven's best. He's, there was a song that uh, we used to sing in the church a few years back. And it's an amazing song. And one of the lines goes, the darling of heaven, or I've also heard it sung as the treasure of heaven, um, crucified. The darling of heaven, the treasure of heaven, crucified. And so that was the best that heaven had to offer. So if he gave up Jesus for you, and he did, And Jesus gave up his own life for you. How will he not along with him graciously? You know, nowadays, I used to be an English teacher. And I've still got that like so deeply rooted in me that uh, language is still important to me. And I hear people say graceful when it is actually gracious. If you're graceful, it's to do with the way in which you move. It's to do with your physical body. But if you deal with somebody with grace, that is gracious. It's not graceful. And so it says that how he's going to graciously, in other words, with all grace, with a loving heart, without any kind of withholding or any kind of judgment, graciously, he will give us all things. Now, guys, this is where we have to believe what the Word of God says. We cannot believe our own reason. We can't figure it out and imagine that we are so evil that God's not going to give me anything. Because God has said in His Word that if He's already given Jesus up for you, and no matter how condemned you feel, if you feel unworthy, you can still hold on to the fact that you're saved. So if you can believe that no matter how you conduct yourself, your salvation is sure, you can also be sure that if you've got salvation, you've also got the all things that God wants to give you. And so that is that is that scripture. And if we cannot believe it, or if we feel that is just beyond us, the reason for that is that we don't know our Father, the one that Jesus called Abba. And has given us the right to call Abba as well. We're told that in Romans 8. And I want to read um, three verses. Romans 58 verses 15, 16 and 17. And he says here, Paul again says, The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you've received brought about your adoption to sonship. Sonship means you become an absolute son of God. He says, and by him, we cry, Abba, Father, because the Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwelling within Jesus allowed him to look up and know that the God he was praying to was his Father. And that is the Spirit he's poured into our hearts so that when we look at God, we don't go judge the one I'm frightened of. 
I'm a slave. I'm so scared of you. We look at him exactly the same way as Jesus did. And we go, you're my dad. You are my Abba. I have a friend who has two little children, um, a little boy called Rai and a little girl called Misty. And they call their father Abba. And I remember one day at, at um, a couple of years ago, uh, Rai was brought down round to my house and um, his dad said to him, you must go and get in the car. And he looked up at him and he said, oh, Abba, please could I go down for a few minutes? And his father looked down at him and said, of course, my boy. And, you know, that has stuck in my mind. Uh, my friend's name is Bax and um, Davy and his wife. Um, and his wife is, <laughs> goodness gracious me, <laughs> sorry, Tam. Tam um, and and Bucks are the ch- are the mother and father of these little children, um, and I and I just love the fact that they've taught their children to call them. I don't actually know what they call Tam. Do you know, Renee? Not the, I'll, I'll ask her. But anyway, just to actually hear these beautiful little children say Abba and ask something and see the graciousness with which their dad in this instance looked down and said, "Of course, my son." That really is how God deals with us. We look up and we say, oh, please, Abba. And he looks at he says, of course, my child. Not if it's something that's going to be bad for us, but I've already taught you on that in prayer. And so he is our loving, loving father. And it says the spirit himself testifies with our spirits that we are God's children. So the Holy Spirit in me, from, from Jesus, testifies, actually tells me inside, this is true, I am God's child. And if, now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. And you know, some of the sufferings that we share in are when people mock us for what it, what it is we believe. And they speak evil about us. And they just long for us to fall flat on our faces. These are all part and parcel of what Jesus went through. And we will, I will not, and I'm sure you won't, deny your faith because somebody mocks you. And so all of this shows us that we are God's children, he is our Abba, and he will graciously give us all things. And I might have shared this before, but if not, and I'm just watching the clock here, and I think I need to stop, don't I? Okay, okay, I've got time to share this with you. But um, if I have done it before, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it's not going to hurt you to hear it again. But you know, like when a, a man goes out to buy an engagement ring, say, for the woman he's going to propose to, and he buys a diamond ring or a gold ring or so, some kind of ring. But it's something that is precious to him. And it's going to be precious to the woman he presents it to. And the jeweler will take it and put it into a blue or a black velvet box and tie it up. Now imagine if he went in there and he paid as much as he could afford for this beautiful, beautiful ring. And he was paying out money he'd saved up, money that he, in in some cases, people give things that they can't really afford, which I don't think is great. But anyway, so he's, he's giving the jeweler a lot of money for that ring that he's bought. Now, imagine if he said to the jeweler, um, I don't want to take the ring as it is. I want to offer it to the lady by opening a box. Please, could you give me a velvet box? And the jeweler goes, no. I'm not going to give you a box. I'll put it in a plastic bag. You can stick it in your pocket. That's not going to happen because the actual, the, the value is the ring and the box is simply so that you can show it off. And you know, that's exactly what it's like. Jesus is the ring. He is the treasure. He's the darling of heaven that was crucified, whom we have received as our Lord and our Savior. And so when we come to Abba, and we say, oh, Abba, I need healing. Oh, Abba, I need, I need finances for this month more than, than I've got. And I'm trusting you to provide for me. He's not going to look at you and go, no, I'm not going to give that to you. Because having given you Jesus, he's given you the very, very best treasure that heaven has to offer. And all those other things are simply a little box. That's all it is. And so I pray that if they, I'm going to carry on with provision next time, but I pray that 
you will really just meditate on the few scriptures that I've given you and that you will think about them and let them sink deep into your heart and really begin to consider the fact that God is your Abba who loves you so much and gives you everything. And I actually want to end with one more scripture. Um, I've just got to find it, yes. This is just one that I love so much. Um, it's actually in Isaiah 23, and it's verses 17 and 18. And it's when the prophet has been prophesying that God is going to destroy Tyre, who is a, which was a very, very wealthy city. And verse 17 speaks about that, but verse 18 is what I want to concentrate on. But it says in verse 17, at the end of 70 years, the Lord will deal with Tyre. She will return to her lucrative prostitution, and that's actually her marketing and trading, and will ply her trade with all the kingdoms on the face of the earth. Now, verse 18 says this, and I want you to listen to it. Yet her profits and her earnings will be set apart for the Lord. They will not be stored up or hoarded. Now, listen. Her profits will go to those who live before the Lord for abundant food and fine clothes. And is that not wonderful? It's not even as if we can go, oh, God doesn't want me to have something that is really expensive. Yes, he does. Because it says all those, tra those all that money is going to be given to God and God is going to set it before his people. And he actually tells you for abundant food and fine clothes, that is your other. God bless you. And think about that this week.